to the symbiosis golden jubilee come late justice why we chandrachud memorial lecture series hosted by symbiosis law school pune under the banner of symbiosis golden jubilee lecture series where we have none other than the nobel peace laureate shri kailash satyarthi to deliver the lecture on sound of silence cry of innocence protecting child rights in india in post covid 19 period i am dr bindu ronald deputy director symbiosis law school pune who will anchor the event the late justice y v chandrachud memorial lecture was initiated at symbiosis law school pune in 2011 honoring eminent indian personalities and to listen to them and this year being the 50th year since the establishment of symbiosis The Golden Jubilee Lecture Series was initiated by our Pro Chancellor Dr. Vidya Yerodekar to bring eminent persons to symbiosis and to nurture the young minds by the thoughts and ideologies of some of the best in the country from different walks of life. To begin on this occasion, may I request Dr. Shashikala Gurpur, Director, Symbiosis Law School, Pune, and Dean, Faculty of Law, SIU, admired for her dedication to justice and leadership qualities, to deliver the welcome address. May I request you, ma'am? Good evening, uh, respected uh, Kailash Satyarthi sir, our respected Honorable Chancellor Dr. S. B. Muzumdar sir. honorable pro chancellor dr vidya rivdekar ma'am honorable vice chancellor dr rajni gupte ma'am all my dear dean colleagues directors dear students faculty invitees guests particularly our international well wishers and visiting faculty justice hedigan professor rebecca todd um, and also uh, professor francesca joining us from uh, italy us and ireland among many others students from across seven faculties of symbiosis international university my fellow directors from the faculty of laws three other law schools in noida hyderabad and nagpur and their faculty members and students a very warm welcome to each and every one of you for us at symbiosis international university and symbiosis law school pune this is a historical moment for many reasons our honorable chancellor always says for him life has been a pleasant coincidence for us it has been a pleasant coincidence today for many reasons first of all it was sufi poet rumi who said that planet needs more healers than successful people healers because the planet always reels under pain either caused by nature or by human nature our children on this planet have been bearing the brunt of this pain and suffering today for us the coincidence is where success and healing comes together first of all in symbiosis itself where success cannot be spelt without double s which symbiosis has and success cannot be spelt without the double s even in kailash satyarthi ji's name so it is a coincidence of those who heal suffering those who balm the wounds of injustice spelling success so it's not that healing and success are separate in symbiosis this year with its mission accomplished in its healthcare accomplishment in the golden jubilee year and for symbiosis law school pune as the host of this justice late yv chandrachud memorial public lecture the coincidence couldn't be better as i welcome you all i would like to lay before you little story behind this public lecture uh, which initially had to be named after justice yv chandrachud but then it took the it wore a double hat of combining the pleasant coincidence of golden jubilee lecture of symbiosis now this lecture was earlier part of a double ceremony of lord day celebration and public lecture we miss the originator of the lord day celebration and lord day oath late advocate ram jait malani who used to administer this oath reaffirming the pledge to protect the constitution 
So this year, due to many reasons, as we all are familiar with, we parted with the Law Day celebration part of it. Probably another coincidence, maybe as a tribute to Advocate Ram Jaitmalani, who is not with us. And also, instead of just reading out the oath, we made it come to reality by listening to somebody whose life has manifested as a commitment to the cause of constitution that is protecting the rights of the vulnerable, especially those belonging to the weaker sections of the society. I'm very happy to share with all of you in Symbiosis International University, every faculty's institute, especially the older institute like Symbiosis Law School Pune, look at public lecture as a platform where we partner with important organizations and we use the platform to disseminate knowledge. So for us, it is a learning beyond classroom kind of avenue. In this institute, we have used it not only in creating legal awareness in extension programs, but also as you will see today, as a platform where we try to instill values. Human rights have been such a global value, part of such a global value, that in Symbiosis International University, it emerges as a value based on which curriculum review happens, curriculum development happens. Ours is the first and one of the very few law schools in the country to have a compulsory human rights course in the undergraduate and postgraduate curriculum. Human rights today is one value around which the entire humankind has been unified. It has been the song of building a better tomorrow. It has been the slogan of a humankind which aspires to remove the seeds of war and to balm the bleeding wounds of injustice. So we thought that through the medium of public lecture, we will rekindle those values in our students by bringing to us, as Gandhi said, it is not just life, where life is a message. It's not just message on its own. I'm very happy that in the life of our dear chancellor, we have drawn so much of inspiration from in his commitment to the cause of those who were silenced in Pune's then landscape in those historical times. In the life of symbiosis, we have felt and lived the value of universal oneness of humankind and melting of differences in the melting pot of knowledge and understanding and quality education. As we see today's event and we bring it together, as I welcome all of you, I'm sure that today healing meets its success in bombing the uh, grueling wounds of injustice, especially in the most vulnerable of the humankind, namely children. I'm sure that at the end of this event, all of us would go back in pledging our own lives, committing to this cause for which India's first and the only Nobel Peace Laureate dedicated his life to. Welcome each and every one of you. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you very much for uh, so beautifully introducing the lecture and the uh, purpose of the lecture. Dr. Rajni Gupte, Vice Chancellor Symbiosis International Deemed University and a distinguished academician has been at the helm of the organization and has nurtured the university with her zeal and passion. I would now request madam to deliver her lecture. Thank you, Dr. Bindu. On behalf of Dr. S.B. Muzumdar, the Chancellor of the University, Dr. Vidya Rodekar, the Pro-Chancellor of the University, my colleague, directors, deans, faculty members, and of course, the chief guest for this, the eminent chief guest for this event, Sri Kailash Sityarthi, I extend a very warm welcome to you. Dr. Sityarthi, as all of us know, is a social reformer and a children's right activist. I'm sure many of us have read about what he has done and all of us are aware of the honor and glory that he brought to India. What I was amazed was the breadth of the activities that he has undertaken. When one reads about the work that he has done, it lies in not only just 
identifying, uh, liberating, rehabilitating these young people who are forced into child labor, but going further to promote ethics in trade. Trade is an area that is of my interest, and this was particularly appealing to me. He established something called the Good Weave International, which was a network of NGOs uh, dedicated to ending child labor in rug making. Not only did he work towards this, but he also dedicated this event, this activity, to creating voluntary labeling and further monitoring and also certifying that the rugs which were made uh, without child labor. And I think this practical insight of taking forward the fight uh, to free child labor is something that I appreciate deeply. Uh, every activity that one reads about in Dr. Satyarthi's uh, uh, active uh, biodata is, is hugely inspiring for all of us. Uh, so to tell you a little bit more about the university, the Symbiosis International University is a multidisciplinary university. It's headquartered in Pune, but we have campuses in Noida, in Bangalore, Hyderabad, uh, Nagpur, and also Nasik. The discipline of law, which is hosting today's event, was, one, was the first one to be established. And Symbiosis Law School Pune has been consistently ranked among the top 10 in the country uh, for many years now. You will also be very happy to know that this university cares deeply about the community around us. And as a part of our commitment to the, universe, to the community around us, every student undertakes compulsory credits in uh, service learning. Uh, it could be students who, have, uh, who are from the law school who would be participating in legal aid clinics, or it could be students from the Health uh, Institute of Health Sciences who would be working towards health and nutrition in the villages around the university or in the locality of the, of the institutions. Besides this, uh, we have also been focusing on financial literacy in the villages around us. I'm sure that this work that we are doing is a, but a small drop in the ocean that really needs a lot of attention from people like you and us. We are delighted that we are here today. Uh, I wouldn't like to take any more time. I'm sure everyone would be eager to listen to you. But uh, before that, I, uh, the, the Chancellor, Honorable Chancellor and the Honorable Pro Chancellor would of course like to welcome you. On my behalf and behalf of everyone, I extend a very warm welcome to you again. I look forward to listening to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Gupte Ma'am. Dr. Vidya Yerubdekar, Pro Chancellor, Symbiosis International Deemed University, has been an exemplary leader who has been instrumental in bringing in innovative approaches to promote internationalization. She's the person who has envisioned to bring eminent personalities and to connect them to the young minds of this university while also extending it to the faculty, staff, alumni and distinguished guests and friends of symbiosis. And we have today our friends from across the country and the globe who are eagerly waiting to listen to Sir. Before uh, that, let me uh, welcome and request Vidya Yerodekar, Madam, to address the gathering. Uh, thank you, Bindu. Uh, our Chancellor, Dr. Muzumdar, Sir, our Vice Chancellor, Dr. Rajini Gupti, uh, Dr. Kaila Satyarthi, the Chief Guest for this uh, function, uh, which is, of course, a virtual uh, function that uh, Dr. Shashikala has organized on behalf of the Justice Y.B. Chandrachud uh, Memorial Lecture and also the Symbiosis Golden Jubilee Lecture. Uh, Dr. Satyati, sir, uh, uh, we welcome you to Symbiosis, this large family of uh, uh, several institutions under the university, as well as our schools. We also have about five schools uh, under the Symbiosis umbrella. And I'm extremely happy that uh, you have uh, agreed to address us. I missed uh, listening uh, to your lecture when uh, Dr. Muzumdar, sir, my father, and my mother, and my son, who accompanied them to Lucknow, when uh, Dr. Muzumdar sir received the first uh, Dr. Kalam uh, award. And at that time, you had given the keynote address. And uh, my son still tells me that, you know, uh, that's something that I really missed. And I'm very happy that Dr. Shashikala, you know, uh, kind of invited you and you readily agreed to address this large gathering. Uh, the Symbiosis Golden Jubilee lecture series is a virtual lecture series that we decided to organize 
so that our students get the benefit of listening to uh, diverse, uh, you know, thought leaders like you. And uh, this has been uh, the fourth lecture in this Golden Jubilee lecture series. And uh, Symbiosis is celebrating its Golden Jubilee year in this 2020, 2021. Unfortunately, because of COVID uh, and this pandemic, uh, we could not invite people like you physically on the campus. But I guess, uh, you know, there is an advantage to a virtual discourse because more number of people can join in. Whereas in an auditorium, you could just have 500 students sitting. Here we have about a thousand people who are uh, or more than that, who are on this platform, as well as thousands of our students who are on the YouTube live platform. And uh, I'm sure each one of them will enjoy uh, your lecture. I don't want to take much time because we've already had Dr. Shashikala and Dr. Gupte speak and after me, the Honorable Chancellor will also be speaking. But let me tell you that I saw the video of your lecture, which is uh, actually uh, a part of our online education at our school where in the 10th standard in the English uh, textbook, uh, we have, uh, we have a, a chapter on you called Let's March. And uh, now because of online education, this whole chapter has been converted to virtual teaching and uh, it is in the form of a video. And I thoroughly enjoyed and I'm sure students who uh, must have listened uh, to this video and who have read your chapter would also want to know more about you. And therefore we also have some school teachers and principals joining this webinar. So what you have done is exemplary. I mean, I'm too little to even comment on, uh, you know, too small to even comment on the work that you have done. But all that I can say that you are a great visionary because visionaries always think differently. We, uh, when we drive on the roads or walk on the roads, we do see several children who are, you know, uh, who are on the roads or who are, you know, uh, who don't have families who, or we also see child labor around us, but we never ever think the way you have thought and not only thought, but actually created this as a movement to inspire so many of us. Like, like my father, Dr. Muzumdar, when he saw this foreign student in a, in a, uh, in a hostel room on Ferguson College uh, suffering from jaundice and was moved uh, because of the plight of foreign students who came to study in Pune City, he established this large organization called Symbiosis. So people like him and you are great uh, people who inspire uh, us and we want you to inspire our young students I'm so happy that at the beginning of this academic year, when we've just started our online lectures, you know, people like you uh, have agreed to address them. So with these words, sir, I once again welcome you. And I hope that this association of yours with Symbiosis does not remain to just a virtual lecture, but we find uh, more opportunities for our students to engage with your work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Vidya Yaravdekar, madam. Dr. S.B. Mujumdar, Chancellor, Symbiosis International Deemed University, is a visionary and a distinguished academician and educationist. He established Symbiosis 50 years ago and which is now in its golden jubilee year. It is Dr. Mujumdar's vision that has taken Symbiosis to great heights and has provided a place where thousands and thousands of students find a place and find education. I request Mujumdar sir to give his chancellor's address. Thank you, Bindu. Today's distinguished chief guest, Dr. Satyarthi, Dr. Shashikala Gurpur, the principal of our law college, Mrs. Gupte, the vice chancellor of Symbiosis International University, the pro chancellor. Dr. Vidya, the faculty, guests, students, and my distant viewers. On behalf of myself and Symbiosis International University, I extend a very hearty welcome to our distinguished guest, Dr. Laurent Kailas Sattarjini. And Dr. Vidya said, I shared a platform with him in Lucknow, where both of us received the first Foundation Abdul Kalam Awards. I still remember his wonderful speech which he delivered then. Well, as Dr. Sashikala rightly said, this is a very eventful year in the history of symbiosis. 
Hemiosis, which was established in 1971, is celebrating its golden jubilee year. It is also a very interesting coincidence that the memorial lecture, which was started in the name of Justice Y.B. Chandrachev, we are celebrating the centenary, birth centenary year of Justice Y.B. Chandrachev. And so I would like to say something about Justice Y.B. Chandrachev for our audience. Yashwant Vishnu Chandrachu was born on 12th July 1920 in Pune. He studied in Dutan Marathi High School, Pune, and also ILS Law College, Pune. So we see that he was born, brought up, and educated in Pune. He is a the longest serving Chief Justice of India. He worked as Chief Justice of India from 1978 till 1985, seven long years, during which he delivered many, many landmark judgments. Dr. Chandra Chaur was also a professor, part-time professor of law in Government College, Bombay. But what is interesting is, just as Dr. Chandrachur was Chief Justice of India for seven years, it's a very happy coincidence, you may call it, or a happy event, you may call it. His son, Dhananjay, also happens to be judge of the Supreme Court. And I hope one day, Dhananjay Chandrachur will also be the Chief Justice of our country. Friends, there is another interesting association of Dr. Chandrachur with Symbiosis International Cultural Center. We used to call it International Cultural Center. Then, Dr. Ashok Chandrachur inaugurated Dr. Mavasar Ambedkar Institute of Research and Development on 26 November 1978. So, this is indeed a very eventful year when we are celebrating not only the Golden Jubilee Year of Symbiosis, but also celebrating the centenary of Justice Y.V. Chandrachur this day. Well, I cannot forget two persons who are associated with today's lecture series. One is, of course, Advocate Ram Jatmalani, and incidentally, I must tell you that he too was a very close friend of Justice Y.V. Chandrachi and Advocate Rani. These two persons started what is we, what we call Law Day, which is perhaps unique event, not only in the history of our law college, but in the history of many, many other law colleges in our country. So be that as it may, we propose to organize a separate function to commemorate the centenary of this is why we generally sometime during this year, when we hope we will invite his son, Justice Dhananjaya Chandrachur, as chief guest to deliver a lecture. Well, friends, I do not want to take much of your time, but suffice it to say that Dr. Kailash Sattar Satyati has devoted his life to a very unique cause, and that cause is injustice done to billions and millions of children across the world and especially in our country. Of course, the poverty is one of the reasons for that. But even then, the injustice that is caused, the harassment to the children, then the child labor that we see everywhere, 
in our country is really pathetic. And the Satyarthi's sensitive mind thought that he should do something to the children. And as a result of that, he started a campaign to protect the children's rights, to protect their interests, to protect them against tyranny, which is there from different corners. And as a result of his tireless work, he received Nobel laureate. We are indeed very happy that one Nobel laureate is going to deliver a lecture during the Golden Jubilee celebration of Symbiosis into the Symbiosis Institute, which was started in 1970. I do not want to take much of your time, but on behalf of myself and also on behalf of Symbiosis International University, I welcome Nobel laureate Satyarthi and request him to inspire our students and viewers who are there, not only in India, but Dr. I. Sachikala said, even in many foreign countries. Thank you. Wish you all the best. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much for introducing the YV Chandrachud uh, lecture, for giving us a background about Justice Chandrachud, and also welcoming our chief guest today. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. A person whose devotion to a cause made him walk a path which many of us would not trend. A person who won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2014. A person who is passionate about the mission he has set out on. Mr. Kailash Satyarthi is a person to emulate. We now have a short video of Mr. Kailash Satyarthi and I request that video to be played now. The Nobel Peace Prize for 2014 is to be awarded to Kailash Satyarthi for the struggle against suppression of young people and children. There is no greater violence than to deny the dreams of our children. I refuse to accept that the laws and constitutions are unable to protect our children. Today is the time for every child to have the right to life. I refuse to accept that the shackles of slavery can ever be more stronger than the quest for freedom, I refuse to accept here. Getting a greeting like this is all the reward Kailash Setyarti needs for freeing these children from a life of slavery. He tries to give these kids the childhood they missed. Do you think these kids see you as a Nobel Peace Prize winner? No, oh, I don't think they, they see me as friend or brother or something like father. I have looked into their frightened and exhausted eyes. I've held their injured bodies and I have felt their broken spirits. I refuse to accept that children belonging to certain sections of society are born to work for others at the cost of their childhood and freedom and education. If the children are exploited, if the children are deprived from their childhood in any part of the world, the world cannot live in peace. The world cannot be human. It's not often the two winners of the Nobel Peace Prize get together, but it happened yesterday when President Obama met Kailash Sartiarte. They were joined by three children who were rescued from child trafficking and forced marriage. You cannot live in isolation. All the problems and solutions are interconnected. And so the problem of child labor in any part of the world is your problem. Setyarti organizes raids with local police, but sometimes employers are tipped off in waiting for him armed. But I have been attacked many times in my life. You had a gun to your head? Literally, yeah. This is dangerous work for you, these kids. Somebody has to pay the cost for freedom. It does not come on plate. So if I, if not me, then who else will do? Come on, I will ride. Who won the Nobel Prize, he asks. In reply, all of us kids. It's good. <laughs>
every single minute matters every single child matters every single childhood matters thank you thank you very much for showing that video i think we have no words to say what is the kind of work that is there which is done by mr kailash satyarthi and this video only shows a glimpse of what he has been doing we started the late yv chandrachud memorial lecture in 2011 we had very eminent speakers over the years who delivered the yv chandrachud memorial public lecture and this includes advocate ram jeet malani shri parasaran to name a few last year we had justice shalini fansalkar judge bombay high court who delivered the yv chandrachud memorial public lecture we at the law school transcribed the lecture into a little booklet which is then released at the next yv chandrachud memorial public lecture today we have the privilege of requesting none other than shri kailash satyarthi to release the 2019 yv chandrachud memorial public lecture booklet may i request mr kailash satyarthi to release the booklet and i also request all the other dignitaries dr s b mujumdar sir dr vidya yaravdekar dr rajni gupte and dr shashikala gurpur to join mr kailash satyarthi sir to release the book Namaste. It is indeed an honor and privilege for everyone at Symbiosis to have this book released, this booklet released at your hands, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Lovely. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Now comes the much awaited time, the time to listen to a great person. I realized that words can't do justice to the work that he is doing. No adject adjectives can sufficiently qualify him. Yet, let me put a few words together to introduce sir before I request him to deliver the speech. Mr. Kailash Satyarthi has been tirelessly, tireless global advocate of children's rights for four decades now. He left a very lucrative career as an electrical engineer and started Bachpan Bachao Andolan, translating as Save the Childhood Movement to rescue children and their families from the shackles of slavery, paving way for their reintegration into mainstream society. Under his ages, the movement has rescued over 90,000 children from the scourge of bondage, trafficking, and exploitative labor till date in India. In 1998, Mr. Satyarthi conceived and led the largest civil society network for the most exploited children, the Global March Against Child Labor, that transversed across 103 countries, covering 80,000 kilometers, mobilizing unions, civil society, and most importantly, children with a sole demand for an ILO convention on worst forms of child labor. This march led to the adoption of the ILO convention 1980. 18 the ILO Convention 182, sorry, on the worst forms of children, uh, child labor, which went on to become the fastest ratified convention in the history of ILO. Mr. Satyarthi is also the architect of the Global Campaign for Education, an exemplar civil society movement working to end the global education crisis. Mr. Satyarthi is credited for the first ever civil society business coalition by establishing Ragmark, now known as Goodweave, the first of its kind of certification social labeling mechanism for child labor free carpets. 
This mechanism was engineered by Mr. Satyarthi much before the phrase corporate social responsibility was even coined. In 2014, he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for struggle against suppression of children and young people and for the right of all children to education. In 2016, Mr. Satyarthi founded a novel and unique initiative, Laureates and Leaders for Children, that has brought together several Nobel laureates and leaders from across the globe to build a sense of urgency, collective responsibility, and a strong moral voice to galvanize political will for ensuring the rights and safety of world's children and young people in an endeavor to end violence against them and creating a child-friendly world. Mr. Satyarthi's unrelenting efforts to end child slavery, trafficking, forced labor, and violence received international support when he succeeded in getting child protection and welfare-related clauses included in the Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations back in September 2015. Mr. Kailash Satyarthi envisions a world where the youth realizes its truest potential as the agent of positive social transformation. It is for this reason he has launched the 100 million for 100 million campaign in December 2016. This campaign is a global intervention to mobilize 100 million youth for shaping the better future of 100 million children who have been denied their rights and liberties. Mr. Satyarthi has raised a demand for a new legally binding UN convention against online child sexual abuse and pornography, and is now working with the heads of the states and other influencers like international organizations, faith leaders, civil society, and youth organizations to see it through. To realize his vision of ending violence against children, he founded Kailash Satyarthi Children's Foundation to work towards a child-friendly world where all the children are free and safe, healthy, and educated. It is indeed an honor for all of us at Symbiosis that you are with us here today, sir, even if it is on a virtual platform mode. And it is a privilege for all of us, which includes the students, faculty, staff, alumni, and friends of Symbiosis to be able to hear you. Request you to address the audience, sir. Over to you, sir. Thank you and namaste to all. My dear children and uh, young friends, respected Ajumdarji, uh, Pro Chancellor, Vice Chancellor, Director, and all faculty members, friends, and well wishers of Symbiosis. First of all, I would like to pay my humble tribute in the memory of Justice Chandrachurji. As was already said that he was the longest serving Chief Justice of India, but more importantly, his reformative and compassionate judgments have put the justice in a different perspective, which was much more human, and he has laid down many milestones. We are all aware about some of his landmark judgments, about the sun dwellers, and also the maintenance for the Muslim women. But there are so many which I'm not going to speak much. Some of you might be already included in this booklet, so you can read this booklet. Today, when I'm addressing you, it is not just addressing students and faculties of a deemed university or, or a law institute. I'm addressing the keepers of conscience of nation. I'm addressing the future saviors of justice. And not only that, I'm addressing 
number of young people who are going to make sure that the poorest of the poor of this country, the most ordinary people who are facing injustices can have faith into the law and justice through you. It is not just the career. It is keeping the conscience of the nation which you are going to take up as a challenge. Dear friends, when I was reading my uh, topic on my iPad uh, screen, um, I could feel differently. When the topic was uh, sound of silence and uh, innocence, suddenly a poem came to my mind and that poem has been written by my daughter very recently, Asmita. As we all know, during last few months, millions of migrant workers, millions of people who were working in different parts of the country to build that nation, to build that country, to build all these buildings and infrastructure, they lost hope in city. They lost hope in the civilized people. And they were rushing back to their villages. They had no idea. They were under fear, uncertainty, and, uh, and frustration. But the most serious was that they have lost the faith in many of us, even in the system. One of the women, uh, Arvina Khatun, 35 year old, returning back from Ahmedabad to Katihar. People saw, people found her dead on the railway station of railway platform of Mujafarpur in Bihar before she reached her home. There were some pictures you might have seen appeared in the newspapers. Most disgusting, most ashamed, most pathetic. Most challenging also, and in one of those pictures, her toddler son was trying to wake her up. She was lying dead. And my daughter has written this poem. I will read it out to put the whole subject in context. Open your eyes, mom. It's my turn to sleep. Open your eyes, ma. It is my turn to sleep. Play with me a little, ma. Sing that special song. Are you playing dad, ma? Even so, it's my turn to play. I am getting scared, ma. I will even let you win. Are you sleeping so deeply, Ma? You never did before. My every turn and every sound was always just enough. Are you pretending, Ma? Because you don't have milk for me? Wake up, Ma. I'm not hungry anymore. I am getting scared, Ma. I am telling you, you won. That is the sound of silence. This is the face of invisibility. This is the story of millions of young people across the world. Girls and boys are sold like animals. Many of the things which we are using our shoes, our clothes, our chocolates, and many of our gadgets which we are using might have made by child slaves in one other part of the world. When we are talking to you in every four hours before this pandemic started, the figure was that eight children go missing every hour in India. Four children are 
raped or badly sexually abused. I'm not talking about data. But every data has a living human being. Who is going to save that? If justice cannot save, if law cannot save. I fought for many issues, but right from my from the beginning of my work, I had gained a lot of faith in the judiciary and law. When the first person, a desperate father, knocked on my door, whose daughter was born and grew up in slavery and was about to be sold to a brothel. I decided to go to rescue her because I thought that if she was my daughter, if she was my sister, what would I do? I will hold the whole world upside down. I will do every possible thing. I went there with my friends. We were all beaten up and thrown away. So one thing which came to my mind was constitution, law, judiciary. I approached one of my friends who brought me to the court, the High Court of Delhi. We have approached the court and got an order within a few days. This 14-year-old little daughter of her, of this man, Sabo, was liberated along with the rest of the people. Though they were not freed under bonded labor law, they were freed under the heaviest corpus provision. I have not studied law but I had faith in it. So we were able to free them. That was the beginning, that was the first spark of building a worldwide movement against child slavery and child labor. But I always believed that law is not justice. We have to make a difference. How laws are able to bring justice in our life, in our society. I will give you one example. There was no specific law to protect the missing children until very recently. There was no law on missing children, so no FIR has been lost. Until unless the parents have to explain that they have some attention, they have some doubt for someone who might have uh, kidnapped the child or so. But we have approached the Supreme Court of India and Justice, uh, uh, Chief Justice and Judges uh, agreed to take up this matter. An order has come and a judgment was delivered later on. It was the first time when the principle of presumption of crime has been established because our argument was my son, who is also a lawyer in the Supreme Court and architect of many policies and laws with the government of India and internationally, he has put a strong argument that when we feed the children, many of them were missing from their villages, but no case of missing children was arrested. So many children who are missing, they do not disappear in thin air. They might be kidnapped, they might be trafficked, they might be enslaved, and there are people behind it. So there is a presumption of crime that was admitted, accepted by the Supreme Court. And finally, the the, the, the sphere of uh, law has been broadened, uh, the borders were pushed, and finally the judgment has come that within 24 hours every single case of such complaint has to be registered, assuming that there was a crime committed. I gave just one example, but there's many, many examples. Some of you might, have, might be aware that in Indian constitution, Education was not 
the fundamental right initially. It was one of the directive principles of state policy. And my own experience, I was fleeing children from slavery and trying to bring them back to school was the most difficult task. Sometimes teachers or headmasters agreed to admit them in schools, enroll them in schools. But in many times they say that uh, their age uh, uh, does not permit, they are 13, 14, 15 year old boys and girls, how we can enroll them in school with a six year old child. All these, these are wretched, dirty people, their language is abusive, etc. etc. So these kind of excuses or these kind of answers were given by uh, by the headmasters. One day near my Mukti Ashram in Delhi, this is rehabilitation center for free children. I took some children, prepared them to be enrolled in schools. They learned reading and writing and basic uh, skills, uh, basic uh, mathematics, counting, etc. But the headmaster just thrown me and those children away, almost thrown did not allow us to, to entertain. I was very angry and I thought that I will sit on hunger strike and do every possible thing. But my lawyer friend suggested that no, neither India has a law for right to education, nor the constitution gives the guarantee as fundamental right. So I tell you, my dear friends, an ordinary activist like me, who had no power, who have no strength, who have no connection, political connection, got an idea that why can't we fight for changing the constitution? If something is missing in the constitution, we can amend the constitution and bring it back. We fought for constitutional amendment to make education as fundamental right. I and my friends organized and led a long march from Kanyakumari to Kashmir to Delhi, where more than 150 parliament members from different political parties attended and joined. We have created a parliamentary group for education with 163 parliament members from across the party. And they all raised strong voice in the parliament that we need to change constitution and make education as fundamental right. Within a year of this long march and our struggle, we succeeded in education became the fundamental right. And then followed by the right to education law. Similarly, the global march was mentioned. There was no international law against worst forms of child labor like slavery, trafficking, child prostitution, use of children in hazardous occupations. So I envisioned a long march across the globe, 103 countries, six month march from three corners of the world. We covered 80,000 kilometers distance. And then we reached in Geneva in, in International Labor Organization's annual Congress, annual conference. No government, no global leader had the moral courage to say no to those children who chanted strongly, loudly, saying that no more tools in tiny hands, we want books, we want toys. No more guns in tiny hands, we want fences, we want books. We succeeded. And as was mentioned, fully last week or so, this ILO Convention on the Worst Forms of Child Labor has become the universally ratified convention. I'm so happy. It looks like my personal, uh, personal uh, happiness and joy. And not for me, but the main, the, the, the sole credit goes to all those young friends who marched across the country, across the world for such a demand. Some of the former child slaves, some of the former um, child soldiers, and so on. They should be educated. But, dear friends, laws are simply tools or weapons in our hands. But not forget what I said in this sentence 
tools in hands. Where are those hands? If you make laws and keep it in libraries, it's good that people will come and do research. Would be happy about talking laws. But we need those hands who can appropriately, timely use those laws. India has some of the beautiful laws, some of the best laws in the world for protection of children. May it be the new child labor law, may it be uh, the POXO Act, may it be the amendments uh, in, the, uh, in the rape laws. And there are so many. Right to education in itself gives a guarantee that whenever a girl in a school, sitting in a classroom, picks up the pencil and starts writing. She does not just writing something for her own career. She is writing the history of the country. She is writing the future of the country. A pencil in the hand of a girl, a poor girl, is much more powerful than an atom bomb. Her writing, we can see, and truth, truth, truthfulness and compassion can bring about change in the world. So for me, the yardstick is very simple. My yardstick for justice, for development, and for any achievement is very simple. Think of a six-year-old boy, six-year-old girl, a tribal or scheduled caste or a Muslim girl who was born in a remote village, somewhere in Maharashtra or somewhere in Jammu and Kashmir or somewhere in Odisha or Bihar. Her father is a bonded laborer. She is born a slave, working at a brick kiln. Most vulnerable for sexual exploitation. She is already physically, emotionally, psychologically, and economically exploited person. Until and unless the fruits of your legal system, the fruits of your judicial mechanism, the fruits of your development, fruits of your policies do not reach to that last person of Indian society, I'm afraid to say that for me, everything is meaningless. If one single child, if this one single girl is exploited and we are not able to listen to her cry, if one single girl is being exploited inside a home by her own relatives and friends and sometimes even by her father, what kind of society we are making? I always say that be angry, my dear friend. That anger should not be misused. Anger should not be uh, wasted for hatred, for revenge, for violence, for destruction. Anger is an energy which has to be kept intact and transformed into new ideas and actions for justice, for righteousness. So, dear friends, we have to make sure that law is not simply to earn money. It is not a means to make your own career and sometimes protect offenders. Your efforts as a lawyer in the future should eventually deliver justice to the last person of society. You can do it. You will do it. I am once again so pleased to be with you today. And I am going to uh, take uh, some of your questions. Uh, feel free to write to me later on also. If you uh, if you are not satisfied, if uh, we don't have enough time to answer those questions, even then you can write to me and I assure you that from now onwards, our relationship is the beginning of our friendship. And that friendship should not be last until every single child in India is free, safe, and educated. You are 
you are the protectors of all those children. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. You're a person who has walked the talk. We are actually in awe at the way you have dedicated your life to the cause of children. Hearing you has left us mesmerized. I hope we are able to do our bit to the cause of humanity in our own ways and support the causes such as yours to make this world a better place for many disadvantaged in the society. Thank you. Thank you once again, sir, for uh, addressing all the people who are there on the Zoom platform, on the YouTube. Now we come to the question and answer session and we have received several, several questions, but due to paucity of time, I will be announcing the questions. I'll be announcing the names of some of the students who have asked the questions and have put forth the questions and I'll read out the questions to you. And uh, so it is going to be an honor to listen to you because these are questions that uh, are about the work. So what you haven't talked, what you haven't uh, told us, you could also be telling so much more through the answers that will come to you, uh, come through the questions that are going to be put forth. So the first question that uh, we have is from a student, a BBA LLB student, Wanshika. And her question to you is, in one of your interviews with the Quaint, you mentioned the need for allocating 20% of the emergency funds to the 20% of the people of the lowest strata. So what measures do you suggest would ensure that the funds are not misused? Thank you, thank you so much. So in my 20 minutes uh, speech, I covered the first part of my topic, considering that I'm going to cover the rest of, uh, of the topic in question and answers because I read those questions, at least one or two, and then I understand that most of them are related to post-COVID-19 uh, response or situation. So um, before answering your question, let me tell you that uh, there were injustices, there were inequalities, there were wrongs and there were uh, exploitations atrocities and so on around the world. Now, the COVID-19 pandemic has exhibited those uh, inequalities and injustices around us. And children are going to be the worst victims. Children belonging to vulnerable and poorest sections of society. Children with uh, special abilities or disabilities child laborers, child slaves, children who were pushed into, uh, into commercial sexual exploitation, children with HIV AIDS and so on. They are the worst sufferers. So therefore, we have organized, I have initiated this, uh, this conversation with a number of Nobel laureates and world leaders. So altogether, 88 Nobel laureates and global leaders agreed to sign on uh, my demand that we need, we are asking the governments of the world, primarily the G7 and G20 countries to, to allocate 20% of the COVID-19 uh, uh, response related funds. When we wrote this letter, there were $5 trillion who were which were committed. That amount of money was committed. So we demanded that at least $1 trillion should be allocated to the most marginalized children of the world. A similar demand was raised to every single president. We have sent this uh, joint uh, letter to all, uh, uh, all the heads of the nations. And finally, uh, we pushed this agenda that this amount should be allocated. But your question is right. Those who give the money, primarily uh, industrialized and rich countries, G7 countries, they have their own mechanisms, they have their own uh, rules and laws uh, to monitor uh, the expenditures. So that is, that is the primary thing. But whenever it comes to the national budgetary allocations, which is equally important, or perhaps more important in some cases, there is a responsibility 
of citizen citizens groups there is also a responsibility of uh, uh, law and judicial fraternity there is also responsibility of media to make sure that this money should be transparently allocated and transparently spent so the transparency would be demanded by the people by people who can bring it if needed to the court of law so that is possible but first of all we have to shift the priority the governments have to uh, to acknowledge that these are the most marginalized people and they need the support so 20% for 20% so we are asking for 20% money to go to the poorest 20% the most marginalized 20% of any country and in the world Thank you, sir. Uh, we have another question, and the question is from Akshit Goyal, who's a second year student of BBA LLB at Symbiosis Law School, Pune. And his question is that in your Nobel Peace Prize lecture, you talked about the power of a single individual and the quality of compassion. How did these virtues help you in your journey? And how does one strive to inculcate these virtues in the pursuit of their careers and goals? Yeah, Akshit, um, you are very smart in asking these questions, or this question particularly. Um, one thing let me tell you that uh, I believe that every single individual is born with a divine power. We are not born unpurposefully. We are not born without reason. It is up to us to identify, to acknowledge as soon as possible in our childhoods, in our young hoods, that what is the purpose of life? Are we making this world a worst place? More polluted? More crimes? More injustices? Or we are going to make it better? More justful world? More safer world? Better world? So, once we start thinking in direction, then we started thinking about our own individual strength. I, I, I give you an example. A boy whom we freed from uh, slavery in carpet industry, when he was freed, he had scars in all his body. But something which was really the, 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 the most genius was he was carrying the wounds and scars on his fingers and, uh, and his palm. He said that whenever he made some mistake or uh, wrongly used the tools for in carpet making, uh, he used to get some cuts. But those cuts, finger cuts, were not uh, healed or treated by any other medication. The employers, the slave masters, used to fill that cut with some rubbed majestic powder and then burn so that the skin and blood and flesh, everything can burn together with bones. So he has shown those fingers to me. But this boy was very strong from inside. We brought him to our ashram, we educated him and he was, he was most valuable boy. His name was Kalu. He was from Bihar. So Kalu was living in the same ashram when I'm sitting here now. And uh, one of the hostels is named after him. So Kalu uh, was a kind of uh, inspiration and leaders for others. He was most helpful. Once uh, Kerry Kennedy, the daughter of RFK, has written a book called Speak Truth to Power, which was released by President Clinton. And uh, this was the book about the lives and works of 50, uh, 50 change makers. So, the moral leaders of the world. And uh, those days, in 1995, she has included my life and work, uh, 96, I think. And then um, the book was released. So I said that I should not be credited for my work only because my children are my inspiration. And uh, I learned from them, and Kalu is one of them. So Kalu was allowed to go there. So Kalu was in, in uh, Washington, D.C., sitting with President Clinton. President Clinton noticed that amongst those uh, legends, uh, 
uh, like Jasmine Tutu or any um, any Vezel or uh, people like that, uh, Muhammad Yunus, uh, this boy was sitting. So he, President Clinton went to him and asked, who are you? So he told his story and then he said that President Clinton, uh, I am doing my best to help my friends, my peers, but you are the most powerful person on the earth. There are 250 million children who are toiling like me. Can't you save their life? What are you doing for them? Clinton never expected this question from a boy of their background. He thought that he was parroted to ask this question. So Clinton asked a couple of other questions. He kept on challenging. And then he said that, I know President Clinton, you are not going to remain the president forever. And I know that you are going to be, your tenure would be over soon. But it is, is it necessary that one has to be the president of the United States? You can keep on continuing doing it, but you have to promise now. And dear friends, let me tell you that when I was coming back within a week and sitting at the airport along with Kalu, I was watching on the television screen that President Clinton has, uh, has increased uh, the U.S. government's support to ILO and for er eradication of child labor from five, uh, no, from 30 uh, million dollars to 180 million dollars. That was possible to one person's moral courage, one person's wise. I'm not telling my story. I told my story during Akshit. I told my story during uh, my my Nobel acceptance speech when I lost my papers. Um, suddenly a story came to my mind, which I read in my childhood, that there was a heavy fire broken out in jungle. All animals and birds were rushing for a safer, safer place, including King Lion. And Lion noticed that there was a tiny hummingbird flying straight towards the fire. And he shouted, what are you doing? Committing suicide. She answered, no, sir. I am going to extinguish this fire. Look at my feet. I am carrying a drop of my water, a drop of water. I am doing my bit. She flew towards the fire. She said, I was born and grew up in this jungle. I cannot do it like that. So that day on the dais of Nobel Prize, Peace Prize, I narrated this story and I told that this is my life. So everybody has a tiny hummingbird. Whenever the quest for justice, the quest for righteousness, the quest for freedom, the quest for humanity, and the pursuit, the pursuit to get it done is born inside us that individual represent the voice of divinity, the voice of God. It is possible. Every single person can do it. I'm not talking about the great people like Buddha and Gandhi and Jesus Christ and Muhammad Saab and all those people. But there's a long list. But ordinary people can make change. Thank you, sir. I think we all want to see a change. And it's also a time that we should try to be the change that we want to see. So uh, thank you for answering that question. We have another question, which is from Ashni Agarwal, and she is also a second year BBA LLB student. And she says that the UN has estimated that as a result of the present crisis, uh, there be going, there's going to be uh, more than 60 million children who are going to be in extreme poverty, which can push the children to go out to seek some kind of work to support their family, or their family might force them to get into work. And if not, they can potentially die of starvation and malnutrition. What steps can the government take and what can we as individuals do to solve this problem? Well, uh, it is a harsh reality. And as I said before, that um, the number of child laborers, the number of child prostitutes, or you can call it children who are forced for commercial sexual exploitation, will grow. 
uh, the hunger will grow and children are the worst sufferers. Another factor is that uh, millions of children uh, may not go back to their schools. Um, as the UNICEF estimated that one point, uh, more than 1.33 billion young people, some say 1.6 billion uh, students are not attending the schools nowadays. And we have seen in the past that the, the, the long closures of school due to any reason uh, normally result in massive dropout of children from school that we have seen in Ebola crisis in the Western African countries. We have also seen recently, uh, two years ago, uh, there was a long school closure across uh, Argentina uh, due to teachers' strike, and it has resulted in a massive dropout. And many of those girls and boys were forced to uh, live in streets or become became child laborers and so on. So uh, our campaign is to ensure that the governments to prioritize the issues of these children. United Nations agency should collaborate with each other because we cannot solve the problems of these children. We could never solve the problem, but now we cannot solve the problem in, in isolation. If some agencies or some, govern, some uh, government departments or ministries feel that um, the education crisis could be solved by the education ministries and labor, child labor thing could be solved by the labor ministry and so on, it is not possible. These ministries should come together. The prime ministers themselves should take the lead. I would urge the prime minister of India to take the lead and, and invite uh, the ministers who are dealing with different aspects of children. But I also demand to every single president and prime ministers in the world that please prioritize our children. We cannot afford to lose the entire generation if we don't act now as a nation as a world, international community. Similarly, as I said before, that 20% uh, COVID response funding should be allocated by the rich countries and we are trying to put uh, pressure on them and we are trying to, to convince them as well. So that will help in doing so. But as individual, dear friends, you can also play an important role. Make sure that in your surroundings, if you see that uh, uh, suddenly uh, some unknown people are taking children uh, on the streets or in trains or in buses or in public transport, then you can have a doubt that these children are being trafficked. You can also see the increase of child beggars on the streets. So these child beggars are not simply uh, doing their, you know, they are not entrepreneurs they, they themselves. Uh, are not earning money for them. So they are, or they could be the victims of trafficking. So we have to keep an eye on them and report to government agencies and report to the police. Uh, but we can also raise our voice because the silence is crime. It is not just that it exhibit, exaggerate crime, but it is a crime. So we can not live in silence in this situation and the post COVID-19 situation raise your voice and inform to the authorities and make sure. You can also collect some old books, you can collect some friends and make um, some contribution in your own way. But I would, uh, I would uh, call upon every single young person who is listening to this uh, conversation to join for this campaign, 100 million for 100 million campaign, which is the human history's largest game-changing uh, campaign uh, to create a new civilization, a new culture, which is led by the youth uh, across the world. 100 million children and young people are facing violence, multiple violence. On the other hand, thousands of you who, is listen, who are listening, hundreds of you who are directly associated with symbiosis activities, I call upon you to be leaders, change makers, champions for the lives of those 100 million left out and who are most vulnerable in the post pandemic and who are vulnerable now due to COVID-19 pandemic. Don't wait for leaders outside my dear friends. There's a leader inside you. You have to just believe in yourself. Sometimes when I talk to some of the, uh, some of the 
film uh, stars um, in, in uh, Hollywood or in Bollywood, um, some of them are very genuine and they say that, look, Elaji, uh, we are just actors. And I tell you, my dear friends, that if you do some good work, if you make some unknown child happy, if you respect your parents, if you really love your spouse or love a girlfriend or a boyfriend, it is not that you are being paid by someone to do this acting of being naive to your friends. You do on your own because you have that, that quality, you have that trait. So if you do something good, you are the real heroes. Those heroes on the silver screens are paid for every single sentence, dialogue when they speak, every single act of good that is just acting. So real heroes are you. You are the real leaders. So, Join so, there, are, so there are so many questions, but uh, I hope you will allow me to ask one more question, uh, which has come. Uh, and uh, one of our students, Jay Babaria, uh, a BBA LLB student wants to know uh, that the ILO Convention 182 has ratified universally and hence mandates that the government to make child uh, labor laws. However, in a country like India, where child labor is so normalized and where usually no affirmative action is taken, how can one aid in removing this evil from the society on a community level? Well, I would request you to find answers inside you. You can find the answers if international law is here, if the national law is there, where is the gap? The gap is inside our minds. This is serious, uh, could say, uh, the lack of uh, moral responsibility as well as the legal accountability uh, in our society. Uh, we have to build that culture of accountability. We have to build that culture of moral responsibility. When we talk of human rights, it is not just uh, something which is to be read or referred uh, in, uh, uh, in the court. Uh, it is all about uh, it is all about creating the culture of human rights. And creating the culture means we have to have believed in that and then we have to practice ourselves. When you see a child in crisis, feel responsible to get her out from that crisis. So, uh, universally ratified Convention 182 gives a mandate and holds those governments accountable who have ratified that convention. So, every four years, the International Labour Organization uh, takes uh, an account of it. So, it's a kind of review process. So, it will go into review, but laws be enacted, international treaties would be signed and conventions would be adopted that will go on. More importantly, that you should feel compassion inside you. I always say that we have globalized knowledge, we have globalized information, we have globalized so many things. This is the time to globalize compassion. There were some compassionate people Today, we have just one child in labor out of 10. It means nine or not. Can't we, as society, human society, as India, as nation, can bring that one child into school and uh, liberate from slavery and exploitation and child labor? We can do, we have the capacity to do. So think in that direction that if world can achieve so much, the last bit of it can also be achieved and will also be achieved. So globalize compassion. Everything is globalized. Now is the time to globalize compassion. And remember that compassion is not empathy. Compassion is not sympathy. Compassion is the feeling for the suffering of others as your own suffering. As your own suffering, with a desire and deep drive to act, to end that suffering. So that gives you an, a sense of urgency, a sense of accountability, a sense of leadership, 
a sense to take action, that is compassion. So let us globalize compassion and that is very much possible. You can play the role now, make sure that you are not using the goods produced by child labor, use your 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 power, powers of your finger and the power on your uh, handheld uh, devices on your mobile phones and once you come to know that there is a child labor involved somewhere in the supply chain raise your voice but tomorrow when you are going to be a lawyer an advocate or a, a judge somewhere a magistrate somewhere don't forget that you are custodian of justice if you allow me i would request you to take a pledge today i'm not just a speaker, I'm, uh, I feel that uh, uh, I'm trying to, to ignite that compassion inside each one of you. I'm trying to ignite that light which is already inside you. I'm just trying to remember, trying to remind you that there is a light inside you. So today I would urge everyone to take a pledge, not just for me, but it is my call to you, take a pledge for the entire generation. That when you become a practicing lawyer, then take some free cases, at least, at least 10 free cases in your career, and you will you will fight those cases until the conclusion. Don't just go and appear uh, and, 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 and your, your uh, job is over uh, until that that survivor gets fullest of justice. So take it to justice that you can do it. 10 cases. If you agree on that, you're always uh, free and I would celebrate it if you write to me directly or if you tweet on my computer. If a few of you will tweet now after this is over that yes, Kailashji, I am willing to take it up. I'm going to, to, to uh, take up 10 free cases, then it will multiply. This would also be the legacy of Chandra Churji. His son is also sitting in the court now as the justice. He will also listen to it, listen to and read to those promises which you have taken at the, uh, while celebrating the centenary of his father. And all judges will learn. So you are a candle in the dark and I'm sure you have kindled a light in the hearts of so many who have been listening to you and you said one student 10 case you've already I'm sure brought many people many students over here who have made that pledge today and so are, are you are you going to 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 become the first person to to take this pledge not uh, as a lawyer but just to inspire other students and uh, tweet me. I'm going to read in my tweet, uh, Twitter account after a few minutes that the director, uh, ma'am, has done it. So my dear young sister, you will be the first person to do it before this ends. But of course, you are carrying this big thing on your head and then you have to talk and be careful because your, your chancellor and pro-chancellor and your vice chancellor are sitting around you somewhere. So, but once it is finished, then you can do it. Sir, if, we, if you permit us to reveal, every year we do legal aid uh, and we handle at least 50 cases in the prison and in the, out in the court. And it involves child uh, rape survivors as well. We don't, wow. yeah, we have a track record of uh, this and we won the award by Herbert Smith Free Hills. We also won the award for a community legal service program by Maharashtra government's uh, grant. So we are continuing our work since 2007 in two villages, which we have adopted, which we made dispute-free village. That is really commendable. 50 by 500 or 5,000 students. I am calculating as an engineer because I could never get admission in engineering college before I learned good mathematics and before I scored 100% mass in mathematics in my younghood. So I'm calculating 5,000 into 10 means 50,000. So not just 50, I'm thinking of 50,000. Thank you. But I congratulate for that great good work you do. 
Yes, sir. I'm sure that many of us will uh, send the Twitter message to you, uh, telling us and taking that oath and pledge. The needles of the clock takes on how much ever we want to have the time to stand still. We have a large number of questions. However, due to the paucity of time, we've had to restrict the questions that have come to us. Sir, you've come to us on a virtual platform. We are looking forward. We at Symbiosis uh, International Deemed University and Symbiosis Law School Pune, we are looking forward to uh, have you at the campus uh, once the pandemic is over too. As we come to the end of this public lecture, I will take this opportunity to thank all those who have ensured the success of this event. And to begin with, I thank you, uh, Kailash Satyarthi, sir, for having taken uh, time off your extremely busy schedule to be part of the Symbiosis Golden Jubilee come late YV Chandrachud Memorial Public Lecture and deliver this lecture today. So it has been an honor for all of us to hear you today and accept our gratitude. And we hope that you will visit us at the university and spend at least a whole day with our students, faculty and staff. I must also place on record the cooperation that we have received from the people from your office for ensuring a smooth coordination in organizing this lecture on the virtual platform. I will also take this opportunity to thank Professor Silawat, Professor Sharma, uh, who's the brother of uh, Mr. Kailash Satyarthi and also advocate Anadi, an alumnus of Symbiosis, International, Symbiosis Law School in facilitating this lecture and getting us this opportunity to hear from Satyarthi, sir. Thank you, Mujumdar, sir, Vidya, ma'am, Rajni Gupte, ma'am, for the Golden Jubilee. Uh, lecture series that you had started, bringing together the law school's YV Chandrachud Memorial Lecture under this banner. I also thank Dr. Gurpur, the director of Symbiosis Law School Pune for her initiatives. I thank some of the uh, Symbiosis Law School friends and well-wishers amongst the audience who are there with us. Uh, thank you, Judge J uh, John Hedigan from Ireland, Professor Rebecca Todd from Antioch University, United States, Professor Daniela Herrera from the University of Catania, Justice Shalini Fansalkar Joshi, uh, Mr. Bhushan Gokhale, Mr. Satish Kot, Ms. Professor Lakshmi Jambolkar, Madam Armin Modi, we're all present on the Zoom platform here. There are many others whom I have not been able to name. Uh, faculty, friends from other institutions, from all the sister institutions of Symbiosis. I thank the IT team headed by Dr. Amit Suratkar, sir, and also the IT team at Symbiosis Law School Pune for all the help that they have extended. And we acknowledge the participation of all our students from all symbiosis institutions, faculty and staff, our alumni and friends and well-wishers who have encouraged us by their participation in this lecture series. It is their presence, it is the encouraging questions, et cetera, from the audience that has always motivated us. As we conclude, I close with once again thanking Mr. Kailash Satyarthi for delivering the lecture and inspiring the students and all the others in the audience. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir.